prohibition was now the law, and along with it followed a huge illegal market for alcohol. The situation in the United States was the perfect cocktail for criminals. Millions of citizens looking for a way to get intoxicating drink mixed together with thousands of people ready to break the law to help them. The 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution had made selling, manufacturing, and transporting alcohol illegal in the United States. And the Volstead Act, a bill sponsored by Minnesota Congressman Andrew Volstead, gave prohibition agents the ability to enforce the law. Criminal organizations like the Mafia quickly realized they could make a lot of money bootlegging. Operating on both sides of the border, they were busy preparing their operations to complement their more traditional crimes of extortion, gambling, and prostitution. The United States was open for business, and crime was organizing for the first time at a national level. There had been a, a lot of organized crime in the U.S. as uh, elsewhere before uh, Prohibition, but it was localized. And you know, there would be an area of every city, you know, in Chicago, San Francisco, New York, there was kind of a red light district, a tenderloin where uh, a local gang might control um, drugs and prostitution and gambling. But when, you, when Prohibition came in, suddenly you couldn't just operate locally because you had huge quantities of physical goods that needed to be shipped from one place to another place. It needed to come through the rail tunnel from Windsor to Detroit, and then from Detroit, how is it going to get to Chicago and to St. Louis and Indianapolis? Well, you need allies in the other cities. So they all came together and formed what became the National Crime Syndicate. The American government and the Coast Guard were well aware of the role of Canada and Canadian citizens in the importation of illegal alcohol to the United States. Only about one third of the uh, alcohol that was imported was by sea, but the perception of the importation of booze is that it came through primarily of the water. No longer able to get large quantities of alcohol in the United States, enterprising citizens like Bill McCoy looked to places like the Bahamas for solutions. Less than a few hundred kilometers off the east coast of Florida, the Bahamas was a British colony without prohibitive laws and could freely export alcohol to foreign vessels. In 1921, with his boat business in Florida struggling, Captain McCoy planned a trip to Nassau to get a boatload of liquor and deliver it off the coast of Savannah. McCoy was already one step ahead of the crime syndicate with his plan. He knew that as long as he sold his illegal goods three nautical miles off the coast in international waters, technically, he wasn't breaking any laws. Using his boat, the Henry L. Marshall, a 90-foot fishing schooner with British registry. McCoy could deliver 1,500 cases of liquor in wooden crates to thirsty customers waiting in smaller contact boats. On his first trip as a rum runner, he banked a profit of $15,000. While sailing back to the Bahamas, he was already planning his next trip north. McCoy was known for having um, a quality product. It wasn't cut, it was pure. What happened to it afterwards uh, may have been something lesser than the, the high quality product that he sold, uh, as is generally understood that many of the uh, rum runners engaged in you know, taking one bottle and making it into three uh, or more. But um, uh, Bill McCoy, uh, you know, was the genuine article. If you bought McCoy's stuff, you knew you were getting good stuff. McCoy's exploits became notorious to law enforcement and to the crime syndicate and McCoy seemed to enjoy navigating freely around both organizations. He was already planning to anchor large ships in international waters so he could warehouse more products and increase sales, a move that would arguably make him the father of Rum Row. Rum Row was a line that stretched from the tip of Cape Cod uh, around Long Island, down the Jersey Shore, to Virginia Beach and beyond. Outside the three mile limit, and then when it was extended to 12 miles, the 12 mile limit sat these huge ships called the mother ships. They were simply, it was anything that could float that had a bottom on it, that had a hold you could put liquor in. They never moved. And the rum runners coming from St. Pierre, coming from the Bahamas, coming from Bermuda, they would bring their goods, drop them off on these mother ships, 
and then the inshore rum runners would come out in their smaller boats and take it to land. There were times um, in beach communities like Virginia Beach or on the Jersey Shore, on a typical day, you'd look out and you'd th think that there was, you know, the entire U.S. Navy fleet had come in. There were so many boats out there. A, a resident of Cape Cod said that if you stood at Highland Light at the tip of Cape Cod and you looked out at night, it looked like the city out there, the lights on these boats. On a calm, clear night, Rum Row was said to have sounded like a motorboat regatta. Between the shore and the three-mile limit, engines rattled and boomed as contact boats raced to reach international waters. Every vessel dangerously running without lights to evade authorities followed routes that could best be described as a busy marine version of Main Street. One night during the summer of 1923, Bill McCoy was said to have set the Rum Row record by offloading 3,400 cases of liquor in just five hours. In the heydays of rum running, good ships with plenty of cargo room were in demand. The faster, the better. And in the early 1920s, some of the most legendary sailing ships in North America were built in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. With a reputation for building fast and reliable ships, it wasn't long before gangsters from the American Syndicate were sent to Nova Scotia to meet ship captains and boat builders who were eager to work. Rum running arrived at the perfect time for fishing communities like Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. In the decade following the end of World War I, fish prices in Lunenburg County had plummeted, and those who worked the sea had their earnings cut in half. In January 1925, about half of Lunenburg's fishing fleet of close to 100 vessels were involved in the rum trade. The lure of big money and working on a rum boat was a seductive option for crews who were familiar with the hardships of fishing. With American crime syndicates offering $2,500 per month to lease a boat, it was an offer that was too hard to turn down. On a fishing vessel in the 20s, uh, a man going to sea from March until September uh, could make around maybe $200 for the whole season. You could make upwards of $300 a month on a rum runner. So it's a question of economics for many people. Lunenburgers are nothing if they are not practical. And uh, Prohibition came uh, in the same period of time as the Depression. There was not the work that there had been. The price of fish for Lunenburg, the primary thing was the price of fish just bottomed out. If Prohibition caused there to be boat orders that kept the shipwrights busy, and those boats then required crews for the fishermen who needed a way to, to feed their families, I think it was a very practical decision. But at the same time, you know, there, there was a temperance union in Lunenburg. So sometimes you had the case where the wife was a member of the temperance union and maybe the husband was a part of this culture of activity, you know, that was nonetheless putting bread on the table. Yeah, it was very unique in that way that uh, these guys were making big money compared to the average Joe. You have to remember in those days, uh, Depression era, um, uh, I've seen records where a boatyard carpenter was making 17 cents an hour. My dad was making a couple hundred dollars a trip every two weeks. Big money. The average deckhand on a rum runner was getting $50 a month. That was big money in those days. A suit, a three-piece suit was like $3. Shoes were like 35 cents. A hat was like $2. Uh, socks and underwear were like 10 cents a piece. A loaf of bread, if you bought in a store, was eight cents. So for somebody to make him, be making $50 a month, right, just for being a deckhand, uh, labor, common labor, uh, that was big money. The U.S. crime syndicate paid for the vessels and the illicit cargo. But in order to operate and crew a rum-running vessel, they hired Nova Scotian shipbrokers. The local shipbrokers made sure the boats had enough fuel for the journey to Rum Row and hired the best captains and crews they could find. Rum runners operating out of coastal towns like Liverpool, Nova Scotia, might have a captain and crew of nine aboard. They would typically spend two weeks per month delivering liquor off the coast of New York.
wealth was pouring into the coastal communities of Nova Scotia. Some locals began wearing fur coats, driving nice cars, and always seemed to have cash. The crew members were making plenty of money, had a profession that nobody openly talked about, and times were good. Now, there were some large homes built here in the, at the very depths of the Depression. Uh, when there was no money around, but uh, the rum running helped to, to finance the building of these homes. While it's easy to romanticize rum runners for their daring sense of adventure and the money they made, the work, however, was sometimes terrifying. My dad was uh, William Philpitt, and he was a rum runner. Uh, they were sailing down to uh, New York with a load of liquor. And somewhere off of uh, New York, uh, a ship approached them and uh, tried to ram them to take their liquor and stuff. Eh? And these people were, would have been all been, had uh, weapons ready to kill any of them at any time to take their liquor. Eh? So the captain of the ship my father was on, uh, my dad said he was a good seaman and he got the, the schooner turned and he, he rammed them. We, we were right through them, he said, and my father used to say, they could see their faces in the water because they left them there to drown because they would have done the same things to them. And so quite often he would uh, wake up screaming and hollering. And as a young child or as a young boy, I never, I was, I automatically knew never to touch my father to wake him up, never go in the room, always call him from the door. In late 1923, Smith and Ruland Boatyard in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, the same builders of the famed Blue Nose, completed their 126th vessel, a cargo schooner that was destined to become a rum runner. 125-foot, two-masted, 90-ton schooner, she would carry a large cargo. The ship was christened the I'm Alone, and it was painted as black as midnight to make her difficult to find on the high seas. Using her sails, the I'm Alone averaged a speed of about nine knots, or around 17 kilometers per hour. But if the chase was on, the captain could switch on the twin diesel 100 horsepower engines that were installed to help the vessel get away. The schooner, which was registered in Canada, became one of the most notorious rum running vessels on the East Coast during the early days of Prohibition she would be a prize to any enforcement agent who could catch her. And the United States government was ready to pour money into the U.S. Coast Guard to make that happen. <laughs> 